turn me on there Here we go did y'all hear all that I need to start over start over you're all right some in the back saying don't start over <laughs> I thought they were just waving at me in the balcony but <laughs> trying to get my attention <laughs> I zoned in, man. I'm, I'm in it. Jesus enters, applauded by the crowds. And in yet just a few short days, he goes through his day of authority when he just names it. He just curses a fig tree, cleanses it. He just is showing himself and showing God. We get to a day Thursday, a day of action in which Jesus is extremely busy paving the way for this hope to come to the world. And it's within that that Jesus institutes this meal called the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. And so keep in mind that He is teaching them and showing them about the significance of what's getting ready to happen to him. And in just a few minutes, we'll observe this supper in obedience to his word when he tells us to do it in remembrance of him. And so would you listen with me for just a few moments as to why we do this? Because once Jesus had this last meal with his disciples, in the midst of that meal, the betrayer, Judas, was called out. He leaves, and for 30 pieces of silver, sells the Messiah. Goes and gets those officials, brings them back. Jesus has that meal with his disciples he washes their feet and just shows them the servant attitude as to what should be present in the life of the follower of Christ. He takes them on a journey and he walks them through the streets of Jerusalem. And, and one of the things that they walk by would have been the, the uh, court scene. And above that court scene and on that stone and all would have been these grape vines and grapes there. And as he's walking, he teaches them what you and I know as John 15. I am the vine, and ye are the branches, and he that abideth in me will lack for nothing. For apart from me you can do nothing. And he teaches them, and he walks through with them, and he takes them to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he tells most of the disciples to stay right where they are. And you guys pray and stay awake and stay alert, only for them to fall asleep probably before he even gets to his destination of where he's going to pray. But in the midst of that, Jesus praying, Father, I understand what's coming, and I don't want it to happen. I don't, I don't want to die this death that is on the plate for me. I don't want to suffer for these folks. I, I don't want to do that, but not my will. Yours be done. Jesus prays that wakes up to see his disciples asleep and goes and he doesn't wake up he gets up sees his disciples asleep wakes them and says can't you even stay awake he goes back in to pray again and he does this three times up to the point that he is so agonizing over this that the scripture says he sweats drops of blood he is agonizing over what is getting ready to come do you realize that he is getting ready to take the sin of the world upon him can you blame somebody for saying, God, if there's any other way you could accomplish your plan, please do it. And yet, he says, not my will, but yours be done. And he understands that this is God's plan. He gets up, walks out. As soon as he gets out of the garden and the disciples are walking, here come the soldiers. Jesus is arrested. Jesus stands trial. Jesus is sentenced to be crucified for doing nothing wrong. Those same people that were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the beginning of the week, have been paid off now and are being paid to say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. 
just a few short days, that's where he finds himself. When you think about the fact that we're here to celebrate a risen Savior, when we, when we sing a song forever, <laughs> and, and, and that that's going to last forever, that that is what it is, and that he will reign forever, the grave is empty, Jesus is alive, never to die again. When we think about that, we can't get there without pausing to recognize what he went through so that we could have that hope. When you look at that cross behind me, it just represents a cross in which Jesus hung upon. But even before he got to that cross, to hang upon that cross, he was beaten. We would use the phrase, was beaten within an inch of his life. We sometimes tell our kids, I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. Can I just tell you the devil doesn't like this message? Watch this. team was singing if I hold this one but you understand what he went through beaten scourged if you see a picture of Jesus in route to the cross that you can recognize him as Jesus you're not getting the full picture of what he went through flesh torn apart body bleeding from head to toe physically worn out from this beating just try to picture that because you need to understand the price that Jesus paid for you you need to understand the price that Jesus paid for your worst enemy because he paid it for everyone he shed his blood. He not only had his blood splattered all over the ground from the cat of nine tails. and man, It's just a gory picture of what he went through. And I go back to that prayer. Lord, if there's any other way, would you let this cup pass from me? But not my will, yours be done. As he's beaten and scourged and beaten and beaten and beaten and then he gets up brought to his feet and forced to carry his own cross beam to Golgotha and he falls beneath the weight of that cross multiple times to finally they call one Simon the Cyrene and they tell him get over here and carry that cross and carries that on out to Golgotha And there Jesus is laid upon that cross. And they take these nails that are like spikes. And they drive one in his wrist area here and one in his wrist here. And they lap his feet and they go through and they put one there. And we think that's what held Jesus on the cross. Once they took that up and they laid it and let it sink down into the ground. And there Jesus is. But I'm telling you it wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was his love for you that it kept him on that cross. It wouldn't have taken but just one word, one thought, one breath, and he could have come down. But he didn't. Because Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life to pay your debt on that cross. Jesus shed his innocent blood for me he shed his blood for you he shed his blood for the world his body was beaten his blood was shed it wasn't spilt I know we sing that in some terms and they don't mean spilt by accident this was no accident this was just the fact that his blood was flowing in such a way that it just looked like it was being poured out There's over 40 references in the New Testament to the blood of Jesus. I want you to know there's power in the blood. <laughs> Whew. 
that blood covered all my sins. That blood covered your sin. Those scriptures that talk about it, talk about that blood being a redeeming blood. It speaks of it being a purchasing blood. It's a forgiving blood. It's a blood that covers everything. And, and this blood, this nasty, this, this red blood stain, blood is not something that once you get covered in it, you are red for life. No, when you get covered in the blood of Jesus, you, become out, you come out white, pure, whole. When God looks at you, he sees a forgiven by the blood of his son, Jesus, person. And when I think of this week and all that Jesus went through leading up to this resurrection and this celebration that, that we will have, that we have every day of our lives, he had to go through that for me. He shed his innocent blood for me. You can turn to 1 Peter and you can turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and you can turn to Colossians chapter 1. You can turn to all those places and many others and you can read about the blood of Christ. There's power in that blood. <clears throat> Have you experienced that power? Has there been a time in your life when you've allowed the blood of Jesus to do its redeeming work in you? I got the privilege of seeing two young ladies baptized this morning. Can I just tell you that that baptism that they experienced was a picture for you of life without Christ, buried like he was buried, crucified to our old ways of life, forgiven of our sins, and come up washed as if we have never sinned before. It's a picture. It doesn't happen when that goes on. It's already happened. It's just a picture of what took place. But what a picture of Christ, of life without him, buried in his likeness, raised to walk with him in newness of life. The blood cleansing us from all of our sins. Knowing there's nothing I could ever have done to deserve it, and there's nothing I could ever do to lose it once I've received it. The power is in the blood. The power is not in me. The power is in the blood. The power is not in my actions. The power's in the blood. It's not whether I do the right things or the wrong things. The power's in the blood. And not anybody's blood. The blood of Jesus. Have you experienced that yourself? Oh, I can take you back to the day that I did. Can you go back to the day that you did? The day in which you realized that Jesus died for you and shed his blood for you. You recognize the fact that he sacrificed his life. He paid the price for you. He paid a debt he didn't owe and a debt you could not pay. He paid it all. Sin has left a crimson stain, but Jesus washed it white as snow. He paid it all. And that's why we can sing about victory. We have the sacrifice, we have the blood, we have victory. Because of what Jesus did, I stand here as a sinner saved by grace. A sinner saved by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Not by anything I've done, but what he did. The scripture says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. See, Jesus died on that cross, just as thousands of others had before died on a cross. Jesus was placed in a grave just like thousands of others have been placed in a grave. But unlike those thousands of others, three days later, Jesus rose again. 
Jesus overcame sin, death, the grave. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? You don't have it because it all lies with Jesus. Jesus, his blood, his sacrifice overcame it all. And if you've never trusted in him, if you've never received that for yourself, you can. And you should. The question is, will you? Will you come to a place that you would accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, recognizing the sacrifice that he made, the, sh the blood that he shed, the price that he paid, and the victory that is yours through him? That would be my challenge to you today. The question I'd have for you, would you receive him as your own? And if you're here today and you've trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, then the question I have for me and for you is, what are we going to do with that? Who are we going to share with that they can experience forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of Jesus? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You must go through the blood to get to Jesus. You must go through the blood to get to heaven. Nothing else but the blood. What can wash away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. And so if you know him, who are you going to tell the story to? Who are you going to share with? If you prize the blood and the impact it's had on your life, then we need to be out there sharing that message. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand to your feet. And I'm going to ask you at this time, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord and you feel like, man, that's something I need to do, as scattered as the pastor was, I just, the Holy Spirit said, this is what I need to do. I would ask you to come and say, that's what I need to do. I want to ask Christ to be my Savior and Lord. If you're here today and you know that Christ is your Savior and you know that heaven is your home, I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord to give you a face and a name of a person that you need to share with the story of what happened in your life and how the blood made a difference for you and how it can make a difference for them. And I'm also going to ask you during this time to reflect on the fact that Christ sacrificed for you His body and His blood. And you prepare yourself for in just a few moments when we observe this last meal, the body and the blood represented here of what Christ has done for you. So you, you reflect and you respond as God's leading you right now. As they sing, you come. Are you hurting and broken?